Hey everyone and welcome back to Bye Holly G, welcome to today's video. So as you can tell from the title, this video is going to be all about celiac disease and I assume a lot of you guys have heard of celiac disease, it is considered an autoimmune condition and it's basically where people react inappropriately to dietary gluten. So in this video I'm going to talk about like what celiac disease is, what are the symptoms, how we diagnose it and what the kind of molecular mechanisms behind the disease pathology is and I'm also going to talk about something called the celiac iceberg at the end which is really interesting so yeah I hope you enjoy this video as usual and you find it useful I mean you might have celiac disease yourself and you might find out a bit more about what's going on inside of you and it might explain why you can't eat certain foods and so yeah as usual give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it comment down below if you have any questions or video ideas and if you're new around here and you want to stick around for more biology content with biology definitely subscribe and hit the bell so you know when i upload timestamps as always will be in the description box but yeah without me waffling and making this intro too long we will dive straight into the video so the first question we're going to answer is what is celiac disease and celiac disease is basically chronic inflammation of your small intestine and that is due to an inappropriate immune response to dietary gluten and as I said at the start celiac disease is considered an autoimmune condition just because our immune system is attacking gluten and gluten is something that's foreign as in it's not self but it's not harmful and our immune system shouldn't attack things that are harmless so it is an inappropriate immune response it causes chronic inflammation so long-term inflammation of that small intestine and the symptoms of celiac disease are as a result of poor nutrient absorption because of all of this inflammation in your small intestine which is where the majority of our nutrients and the breakdown products from digestion are absorbed into the bloodstream so you have gastrointestinal symptoms gi symptoms and those include like bloating, diarrhea and vomiting but you also have non-GI so non-gastrointestinal symptoms and they include like delayed puberty, anemia, skin conditions and skin problems and within the small intestine there are normally three key features that we will see in those who have celiac disease. The first is atrophy which means degeneration and then the second is flattened villi. So in the small intestine, the small intestinal wall is folded into loads of villi and that is just to increase the surface area to maximise the rates of absorption and those villi are flattened in those who have celiac disease and then thirdly you will see hyperplasia which means increased cell division or cell proliferation so we have more cells and they're dividing more rapidly and more than normal just because they're trying to undergo repair so as i said those are three kind of key characteristics of someone's small intestine if they have celiac disease so the next question is what is gluten because as i said celiac disease is ultimately caused by someone consuming gluten and basically gluten is a mixture of two proteins it's also what gives dough it's like elastic texture it's found in wheat wheat derivatives so like durham spelt and semolina and it's also found in like barley and rye so it's found in a lot of food products and as i said it's a mixture of two proteins the first are the gliadins and then the second are the glutenins and they have different solubilities in aqueous alcohol so the gliadins are soluble in aqueous alcohol whereas the glutenins are insoluble in aqueous alcohol and what's important in celiac disease is that it's the gliadins that are thought to drive that pathology and that inflammation in the small intestine not the glutenins. So the next question is how does celiac disease like come about? What's the molecular mechanisms driving the disease pathology that we see in celiac disease? Firstly what happens is someone consumes gluten and that gluten starts to be broken down. However it's the gliadins in the gluten that have a very dense proteinaceous structure and they have a low surface area to volume ratio and that kind of hinders their digestion and its breakdown. And proteins when they get broken down they are digested into amino acids. They can sometimes be broken down into single amino acid units or small peptide chains but because these gliadins are quite difficult to break down as i said they are only broken down into like oligopeptides so they're like fairly long chains of amino acids still like they're not fully digested secondly what happens then is that those gliadin oligopeptides they abnormally pass the epithelial barrier in the small intestine and normally that barrier should be a tight barrier like a seal that doesn't allow things to pass across it very easily and we have these things called tight junctions and they are 
really important in holding those cells together of the barrier. However, in someone who has celiac disease, as I said, those gliad and oligopeptides, they pass that epithelial barrier and they gain access to the underlying lamina propria is what we call it. And that is also where we find the GALT, which is gut associated lymphoid tissue. That is part of the immune system in our guts, in our small intestine. And that is where we can start to drive this inappropriate immune response. But what's really important here to note is that normally that epithelial barrier is a barrier. It functions to prevent those oligopeptides from passing across it. But in someone with celiac disease, that barrier is normally leaky. And that is as a result of some sort of underlying cause, which we are still investigating. It might be as a result of some type of underlying infection, which causes those tight junctions to be leaky. We also know that, for example, like high stress or alcohol consumption can increase the leakiness of our epithelial barrier. So as I said, whilst we don't know exactly what has made that epithelial barrier quite leaky in someone who has celiac disease, but that is important in allowing those gliad and oligopeptides to pass across that barrier abnormally and therefore initiate that immune response in the underlying tissue. The next thing that happens then is those gliad and oligopeptides, they undergo deamidation and they are deamidated by a particular enzyme. And that enzyme is what we call tissue transglutaminase. It is normally involved in like remodeling tissues, but in this case and in celiac disease, it causes deamidation, not deamination, which is similar, but deamidation of those gliadin oligopeptides. And within that lymphoid tissue, as I said, that GALT, they are taken up by a particular type of immune cell called an antigen presenting cell. An antigen presenting cell will present peptides to other immune cells to activate them. So this APC or this antigen presenting cell will take in those modified gliad and oligopeptides. It will break it down into smaller peptide units in the antigen presentation pathway, which we're not going to talk about, but it basically processes those peptides and it sticks them on molecules that we call major histocompatibility complex antigens. I just want you to remember it's MHC. Those peptides that are broken down further inside the APC, they are loaded or put onto MHC molecules. And that is how they present them to the immune system. So we have a peptide MHC complex, we could say, and that is acting as like a flag. This antigen presenting cell is presenting this antigen on an MHC molecule. I will do a whole video about MHC at some point because it's really, really important in the immune system and in our bodies in general. And the importance of that deamidation is that it means that the peptides derived from gliadin, when they are loaded onto MHC, they bind to the MHC molecules with a higher affinity. What's also important about celiac disease and about this antigen presentation step in particular is that people who get celiac disease, they have an underlying genetic susceptibility. They have certain genes or more specifically certain versions of genes called alleles that predispose them to celiac disease. And in this case, it's all to do with the MHC. And MHC is also called HLA, so human leukocyte antigens. And basically in those who get celiac disease, they will either have HLA DQ2 or HLA DQ8. If you haven't studied the MHC or HLA, then you won't really know what those numbers mean. But I just want you to think of it as a particular version of the MHC molecule or HLA. The majority of those who have celiac disease, so about 90 to 95%, will have HLA DQ2 and then the rest will have DQ8. But what we can say is that these particular alleles or versions of MHC they are necessary, but they're not sufficient to drive celiac disease. And what we mean by this is that they are necessary because if someone does not have HLA DQ2 or HLA DQ8, then you won't get celiac disease. But they're not sufficient because someone can have HLA DQ2 or HLA DQ8, but not get celiac disease. For example, they might have these particular alleles, but they might not have that leaky gut barrier. You know, they might not have that underlying infection if it is driven by an infection that makes the tight junctions leaky and so those oligopeptides derived from gliadin can't pass across the barrier does that make sense i hope that makes sense but basically they're necessary but they're not sufficient as in you have to have them to get celiac disease but if you have them it doesn't mean you're automatically going to get celiac disease just to summarize then number four is antigen presentation by the apcs and then number five is basically immune activation once these antigens that have been derived from gliadin are presented on hla dq2 or dq8 by the apcs 
then that APC can activate other immune cells. Most importantly, we activate our T cells and our B cells of the adaptive or the specific immune response. And that leads to a chain of events that basically result in inflammation. And as I said at the start, celiac disease is chronic inflammation of the small intestine. The next question is very easy to answer. How do we treat celiac disease? It's basically through diet modification. You have to remove gluten from your diet. So you have to remove all of the products that contain gluten. So like wheat, wheat derivatives, as I said, barley, rye. It can be really difficult, but there are so many more gluten-free products nowadays. And then the next question after this is how do we diagnose celiac disease? So obviously someone will present with symptoms, but we need to formally diagnose it. And we have two methods that are both based on serology. So serology is where we look at things in the blood, in the blood serum. Both of the methods are also based on the use of antibodies and I do have a whole video about antibodies if you're interested in checking that out I will leave a link to that video up here what I want you to know for now in this video though about antibodies is that they are made by a type of b cell called a plasma cell and they're very specific molecules they recognize certain structures that we call antigens so an antigen will be recognized by an antibody and in these two methods of diagnosing celiac disease we're basically looking for two particular types of antibody the first is the detection of anti-gliadin antibodies and so these are antibodies that recognize gliadin so in this case gliadin is our antigen and our antibody is the anti-gliadin antibody that will bind to that gliadin these can be used we can look for these anti-gliadin antibodies but they're not specific to celiac disease and that we see them in other conditions as well so if you detect them there is a chance that it's celiac disease but it might be something else and that's why we have a second method which is based on the detection of a different type of antibody and this time we're looking for antibodies that bind to tissue transglutaminase so that was the enzyme that modified that deamidated those gliadin oligopeptides and we're basically looking for antibodies that bind to this enzyme so we're looking for anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies it's quite a mouthful but again the antibody is the anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody and the antigen is tissue transglutaminase and whilst these antibodies are not responsible for like dry inflammation and therefore the disease pathology it's just that we can use them simply as a diagnostic tool and in this case they are specific to celiac disease in that we only see anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies in those who have celiac disease not any other condition coming back to what i just said before about antibodies they are made by a particular type of b cell called a plasma cell and in order for a b cell to turn into or differentiate into a plasma cell and therefore release antibodies it has to have been activated I'm not gonna go into it in this video and you can maybe do some more reading or ask me down below if you want a bit more of a detailed explanation. But basically these B cells, they have to have been activated to differentiate into plasma cells and release the anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies. And whilst we all have B cells that will be able to recognize tissue transglutaminase we don't all have b cells that will be activated to then differentiate into plasma cells and release those anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies you know it's only in those who have celiac disease that will see activation of those b cells so that they differentiate into plasma cells and release those antibodies and that b cell activation has to happen through a mechanism that we call linked recognition again as i said i'm not going to go into it but feel free to do some more research or ask me down below the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is this thing that's called the celiac iceberg there are basically different presentations of celiac disease and we kind of have different types of patients so we have this iceberg which is a triangle on my diagram and the peak of the iceberg is above the water level and the rest of the iceberg sits below and as i said we have three presentations of celiac disease we will have those who are symptomatic and they sit above the water level they represent that peak of the iceberg Below that then, just below the water level, we have silent cases of celiac disease. And then deep down under the base of the iceberg, we have latent cases of celiac disease. But all of them will have two things in common. So everyone who has celiac disease, as we talked about before, has to have a genetic susceptibility. They will all either have HLA-DQ2 or DQ8. Remember before I said the majority of individuals will have DQ2, but regardless, you have to have those particular types of MHC molecules. And then secondly, all of these patients will also test positive for anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies in that you have to have those present in your serum. So those are the commonalities, the common uniting features. And now I'm just gonna talk through the differences between the types of presentation. So the symptomatic cases then, those who represent the peak above the water level, hence their name, those patients will show symptoms of celiac disease and they have to remove gluten from their diet. And they will also show the three 
hallmark features in the small intestine. So those were the degeneration or atrophy, hyperplasia, and the flattened villi. The silent cases then that are just below the water level, they are silent in that they show no or very minimal symptoms of celiac disease. However, they do show those hallmark features in the small intestine, those changes associated with the inflammation. So the atrophy, the hyperplasia, and the flattened villi. Now, in these cases, again, it's advised that gluten is removed from their diet, and it might just be that they need to consume more gluten to show symptoms or develop symptoms, or it might be that the small intestinal damage is really minimal and that doesn't result in symptoms. The last type of presentation then are those lacing cases and they sit right at the base of our iceberg. And these are lacing cases because even though they have the genetic susceptibility and they also are positive when we test for the anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies, they don't show any symptoms and they also don't show any changes in the small intestine. So these patients are quite enigmatic in that we don't know whether they should remove gluten from their diet. We don't know whether if they keep eating gluten, they will show symptoms later in life. So there is still quite a bit of research to look further into these different types of presentations and what the advice should be for these patients, these latent patients in particular. The final thing to say about this iceberg is that it's quite interesting because the position of the iceberg and how big that peak is can like change over time. So for example, at the moment, we see fewer symptomatic cases in children because they're kind of more robust and that they're better able to tolerate that tissue damage in the small intestine. And so we don't see, as I said, as many symptomatic cases. We see more of them being silent or even latent. So that was basically celiac disease. I hope you learned something new. And this was my first video about an autoimmune condition. I am planning to do more about autoimmunity in general, but I wanted to start with something that a lot of people know and have heard of but maybe don't know that much about in terms of the biology behind it so definitely like this video if you enjoyed it comment down below and subscribe if you're new hit the bell so you know when i upload and as always i will speak to you very soon in another video bye